Hey, sports fans, Coach Nick here, and welcome to another edition of the Starting Five with Ben Heisler, our Thanksgiving week episode. Ben, are you getting ready for the Thanksgiving weekend? I'm ready, Coach. I'm ready to get back from Kansas City and get back to Chicago. We just eat a boatload of turkey and stuffing and a little bit of cranberry sauce. You have a you go to Thanksgiving dessert. For me, it's chocolate pecan pie every time. Oh, I, I, I eat pumpkin pie year round and I, I get a crap for it all the time when I bring it like in the middle of summer, but it's got to be pumpkin pie for me. Well, I think initially if we got, can do that awkward segment into the show with this, I think <laughs> something that I think a lot of Cavaliers fans were thankful for was LeBron and Cleveland and Kevin Love. Now, it's been a struggle. The team has just failed to find any sort of identity so far. Uh, LeBron saying that he stinks and he needs to play better. Kevin Love scoring and rebounding numbers really have just not been there. Basically, at the level he was at, where he was at a rookie level, it, he just hasn't gotten to the point where I think a lot of people expected from him this year. And also now, Coach, there's reports that LeBron's message to the team when he addresses them is different than of head coach David Blatt. How do the Cavaliers get on track here? Well, you know, the way the offense works, it's not looking anything like what David Blatt was putting in originally early in the season. So it's a mess. They don't, they don't have very good spacing. They have a lot of instances where the guards will just pass and stand there when you know that that's not what David Blatt wants at all based on how his motion works. So it's a real mess. They're also going to have to figure out where to start the players in the possession because I, I've seen evidence of things where Love will get a pin down and then feed Marion in the post when it should be the exact opposite. So it could just take time. We have to probably give them about 25, 30 games before we can really start to judge them. And unfortunately, because it's Cleveland and because it's LeBron, they're getting judged way early. Yeah, the scrutiny is going to be then be on them right from the beginning. But somebody like Kevin Love, who can become such a good player and such an impactful player for them, how do they get him more involved in the offense? This is a whole media ridiculous uh, misnomer. I'm telling you right now, he is involved. I, I actually looked at the post-up numbers, and he is on pace for almost the same amount of post-ups as he got last year, like half a game less than he did last year early on. So he's getting post-ups. They're giving him the ball there, and I think he's getting some spot-up opportunities as well. So I, I think it's all somebody just making up things out of thin air. He's just not shooting that well from the spot-up area. Yeah, well, his three-point percentage is down a little bit. But you're right, yeah, the post-up numbers are there for love. And certainly I think it'll be interesting to see whether they get their defense back in order. It's something that Blatt has been stressing for a long time. I, I think ultimately they'll be fine. It's one of those situations that take a little bit of time, a little bit more communication. I think what it does show is the terrific work that Spolstra did in Miami right from the get-go. Well, don't forget, in Miami they had the same kind of issues as well going in the first part of that first year. They were only 9-8. and eight. Uh, the first 17 games. So everyone's, this is very natural to go through this. And Spolster, remember, wasn't the new coach either. So he had an advantage there that uh, Coach Blatt doesn't have just yet. And uh, any of this notion of him being in the hot seat, I, I think is just outrageously horrible. No, I agree with you there. Another coach that's in his first year uh, is over with the Brooklyn Nets, and that's Lionel Hollins. And we're starting to see a little bit of a rift between him and Brooke Lopez. I want to read you this quote. Uh, this is from uh, Kurt Heelan over at Pro Basketball Talk. He's talking about Brooke Lopez, Brooke Lopez and says, he's the same Brooke. He can score. He needs to be better defensively. He needs to be better rebounding. He needs to be better passing the ball to his teammates. There's people that come into this league their whole life, they're only asked to do one thing. When you get to this level, it takes a little bit more to win. I'm trying to ask him to do those things. A Brook Lopez coach was playing like an all-star before he got hurt a season ago. Any concern about a possible rift between these two guys here? I mean, I've heard on the audio tapes, there's other quotes he's got out there, too, yeah. that are pretty bad. Uh, he's an old school, old school coach, doesn't necessarily stick to that positive uh, mantra that a lot of younger coaches uh, want to stick to. Um, and whether or not that's going to work on Brook Lopez, I don't know. He's a very smart guy, went to Stanford. Um, and I, I don't mind what he's asking him for. Certainly, you, you probably need your center to pass a little bit better, play a little bit better defense. So those are not issues, but you hate to see it go in the public eye like this. And uh, it could be a problem, especially as a rookie, uh, it's not, not a rookie coach, but certainly his first year there. Uh, the last thing you want is your starting center to be at odds with you. And, La and Hollins, especially during his time in Memphis, obviously he showed the type of coach he was and really got the most out of his Grizzly spot. But there were times where it was a little bit uh, of a back and forth between him and you know, his players, him in the front office. It wasn't always the best relationship. I, I look at this situation and say, okay, if you're going down this road, are you actually considering trading Brook Lopez? If they are, I think it would be a complete mistake because you know what he's capable of doing when healthy. And I think he's instrumental to the offense, especially when he gets going early on. Uh, I'm not that enamored of Brook Lopez. He shoots those standstill 18-footers. 
Uh, he, he isn't as mobile as others. Then again, listen, I understand it. a big guy that can score 20 a game is, is rare and it's worthy of trying to keep him, but I don't know. You know, he's always injured and I, I, I don't know. And I don't know what kind of value he might have in the trade market anyway. So, okay, if they are considering moving Lopez, I mean, are you actually going to get fair value in return for him? Because that's where I think the issue lies. I think if you trade someone like Lopez, even with the injury concerns, you're just not going to get enough back that says, you know what, that still makes us a better team long term. At least I believe. I agree. And listen, you know, they could trade for Cayman, you know, and if he can ever stay healthy or healthier than, than Lopez, it would be a, right. an upgrade. That's good. They can make the team older than they already are. Right. <laughs> Let's continue on here on the starting five. He's Coach Nick. I'm Ben. Toronto right now is looking more and more like they could end up as the number one seed in the East. Uh, the team is uh, probably the hottest in the NBA as of now. Masai Ujiri talked about it um, over on NBA TV about how impressed he's been with the team's desire to win, not just uh, you know the talent on this team. Is Toronto conceivably a team that could be a number one team in the East? You know, I wasn't sold on them, really. I thought maybe they were getting close to their ceiling last year with that first round exit in the playoffs, but uh, they have a very, very good team. They are playing well. They, they seem to have achieved that Jedi confidence that they've been, you know, lacking before. Um, so, you know, it's only a question of are they, you know, experienced enough? Was that first round exit in a tough seven game series enough to kind of get them uh, chiseled into a conference leading contender? Um, I, I think the jury is still out. We got to see them go on a, on a, a little bit of a long, uh, I want to see them on the road a few, a few more games against some tough teams and see how that matches up. But, you know, right now Cleveland isn't going to be able to, 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 um, to contend with that. And Chicago, if they can't get Powell and Rose healthier more consistently, then, uh, yeah, they have a legitimate shot uh, to battle like a team like Washington. Yeah, I think so, too. I think we'll get into the health of Chicago in just a second. But what's impressed me the most is that I thought maybe after Lowry and DeRozan and, you know, maybe an improved play of Amir Johnson, I, I didn't love the depth on this team. But since then, I mean, you've seen good minutes out of Grievous Vasquez. Lou Williams was just the... Uh, the East player of the week, the depth on this team has really stood out to me and has also really impressed me as well. I, I agree. And they have, you know, a decent uh, coaching philosophy installed. They run a lot of horns, which is always good. You love the horns. So, um, yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm excited about it. And I cannot wait for all you Toronto Raptors fans. We are going to be doing a big breakdown of them very soon. So keep stay in your seats for a little while longer until we can get the footage. Awesome. All They've been that. waiting for a long time, Coach. I'm glad you're able to reward them with that. Uh, we were talking <laughs> about a team that uh, could contend for the number one spot in the East, and that's the Chicago Bulls. And, and right now they're still playing well. They're on that tough circus trip out on the West Coast and eventually moving on to the East Coast. But nobody can stay healthy, Coach. Joe Kim Noah had an eye injury earlier in the week. He's been diagnosed with a left knee effusion, which I guess is basically like water around the knee. Uh, Derek Rose is finally back in the lineup, but who knows? He could be gone tomorrow. Uh, you have the Taj Gibson injury. Kirk Heinrich has a chest injury. To me, what's m very much a concern for this Bulls team is that Thibs has always had a notion to play these guys top minutes and basically wear them out come playoff time. The problem that I'm seeing here is that maybe this is an impact of so many minutes from before and guys that are already a little bit injury prone already getting a wear and tear on their body. Do you have any concern about the Chicago Bulls injuries now and especially come playoff time coming back to haunt them at all a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the problem with playing with your, your starters and your go-to guys so, so much so early is that you don't develop guys like maybe Tony Snell could develop right. with more playing time and, th and those kind of players off the bench. And, uh, yeah, they, they're going to be nicked up and banged up because of the way they play defense as well, which is great and tough, and I love it. But it also leads to the kind of things where, you know, Kirk Heinrich can go down with the nagging stuff. And the next thing you know, you're, they're completely thin at the guard spot. Rose is really a troubling thing. I hate to say it, but um, I, don't, I just can't follow how he can, you know, he can't seem to get healthy enough to stay on the court for two games in a row. Pau Gasol has been showing us that he's old and, you know, similar to what he was doing in the Lakers. Like, you know, he's he having a lot of trouble playing more than 65, 67 games. It's going to be a problem. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And again, I, I'm looking at the depth with the Bulls. That, that's part of the reason that you're a championship contender. Yeah, you have guys that are going down with injuries, but the problem is that Thibs is refusing to play a lot of these guys the minutes that they need to build up your championship team. Tony Snell is a good perimeter defender. Not, maybe not great yet, but I, I think he's a guy with really good length that could get some opportunities to play. Jimmy Butler's been averaging anywhere around the lines of like 36 to 42 minutes a game. So if he misses any time, then almost Thibs is left with the situation of going, what am I going to do here as opposed to trying to get some guys working into your rotation? 
And you know what? That might just force him to finally play McDermott a lot of minutes, play Miritich more minutes. Um, you know, they might lose a couple of games, but it might benefit them later with that extra uh, experience that they need to get comfortable in the NBA. Yeah, I think so, too. And listen, you have you have Nazi Muhammad on the bench if you need him to play five, six, seven minutes just to spill Noah a little bit. I mean, he's not great, but it's Nazi Mohammed, but at least you know what you're going to get out of him. Final one for you, Coach. Let's have a little bit of fun. Christmas is uh, coming up close. We're approaching our Thanksgiving edition here of the starting five. I'm going to give you a few over-unders, and you're going to tell me a little over, a little under, as to whether or not these things will happen by Christmas time. You ready? Let's go with two and a half wins for the Philadelphia 76ers. Are you give me the over or under on two and a half wins. <laughs> they don't have any right now, right? Correct. Uh, you know, I, I, I gotta say, I might have to say under. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to take the over. Cause I think at some point they'll end up with a decent part of their schedule and get something random, inherent at randomness a little bit early on the season happens on the NBA, uh, a lead of five and a half games for Portland in the Northwest division. You going over five and a half or under. I got to go un, uh, under that. I think that they're going to settle down a little bit and not have that big of a lead, but they'll probably still be in the lead for sure. I think they'll definitely be in the lead, but I see it more along the lines of maybe three or four. And then final one for you, Coach. Cavs, currently a game under 500 when we're recording this show. Over and over under four and a half games, above 500 for the Cleveland Cavaliers by Christmas time. Wow. Well, that's not that much time. We got like a month, um, got a month. you know, 15 games. I would say under. I think they're going to struggle until Christmas, until you know the New Year's. Wow. I see. I think they're going to start to turn it on a little bit. I, I think you're getting to the point where LeBron is feeling like it's rock bottom, and and Blad is feeling like this is okay. We can only go back up from here, even though they're only a game under 500. But it's too talented of a team to sit that low for that long. And we're too talented of a team to stay on YouTube for our full segment. So starting next week, sports fans. You're going to be able to catch this entire show on our .com one click away. We'll tease it on YouTube so you can see a little bit, but then we'll be right over there on the .com side. Just the same as always, one click, away, one click away, really easy to watch on mobile or on your desktop. So, Ben, I know you'll look even better on the .com. Well, let's not lie to the uh, viewers just yet, <laughs> Coach, but uh, it should be fun looking back to getting the full show over at bballbreakdown.com and another great edition of the Starting Five. And absolutely, and don't forget a b-ball breakdown. We're not a channel, we're a conversation. You win? You win, Ben? I'm in, coach.